I'm going to start with a warning. I'm really nervous, um, as you would expect. <laughs> also, this is really scattered because um, I'm a student, obviously, and I write things like I'm writing a an essay for literature. So there's a lot going on in this, and, and that's your warning. <laughs> um, so today, I wanted to focus on doubt. It's something I've experienced a lot. I have thousands and thousands of questions and very, very few answers. I'm going to read you something word for word that I wrote a while ago. People often call this phase of life typical teenage questioning. It's just a phase. I hope so. Or they try to explain it away, but once it gets hard, it always falls on the shoulders of, ask God when you get there, I guess we'll never know, and God works in mysterious ways. I hate these phrases. And I stand by that statement that I made over a year ago. At some points, I've decided that God isn't real. Other times, I've decided to put it away and stop wondering at all. I've kind of thought that maybe it would be easier if I just tried not to think about it. Doubt is a big struggle in my faith. So, first of all, why do we have doubt at all? What's the point of it? Here comes my first piece of brutal honesty. The Bible is literally insane. <laughs> it starts out with an all-powerful, all-knowing God who has just always been there. He creates everything out of nothing, completely nothing. Then it ends with a magical man-god who goes, who dies a brutal death and then rises from the grave as not just a ghost, but a holy ghost. He goes up to heaven to sit at the right hand of his father, who is also him. But at the same time, he is down here with us in something like air form. If you believe in this ghost, then when you die, you go to heaven to live in paradise. And if you don't believe in him, then when you die, you live in a fiery pit for the rest of your eternity. Please don't accuse me of blasphemy. <laughs> um, I promise this all has a point. So, do you realize how ridiculous that story sounded? Do you know what else sounds ridiculous? <laughs> Every other story of creation I've ever heard. Every other theory there is out there. Even the Big Bang is completely bonkers. I mean, okay, so we start out with space. How did, how did it even get there? I don't know. How is there even consciousness? I'm not sure. It's there. Then boom, the entire universe. That makes no sense to me. Neither does the Bible. So, it's all crazy. I like to say, anything you can believe is crazy. It just depends on what kind of crazy you believe in. We are all just a bunch of crazy humans trying to navigate a crazy existence. Even Peter admitted that. 2 Corinthians 5.13 says, If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. I guess that kind of sums it up. We all experience doubt. God has asked us to believe in a crazy story. Of course, we will be skeptical. I've been reading Jeremiah lately. So far, I've seen that Jeremiah was going through a bit of a difficult time. That's nowhere near an exaggeration. Jeremiah 2018 says, Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow, and shame. That's definitely pretty hefty. In my notes beside that verse, I wrote, Even Jeremiah had doubts. He questioned his purpose and miserable life. He would have been better dead, but God used him. Even a prophet questioned. That's a pretty comforting thought to me. Maybe it's terrible, but my favorite quotes from the Bible always seem to be the depressing ones. I think it's because those are the quotes that show us humanity the most. For example, Ecclesiastes 1.8, which is another depressing one, <laughs> says, Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. I think this sums up doubt pretty beautifully. Everyone has experienced it. We will all continue to experience it. Why? Because we are humans. Because we will never be satisfied with not knowing. So why did he, God give humans skeptical minds? Isn't that why so many people turn away from him? Why would God do it? I'm not sure, and we will never know for sure. After all, if we did, even if we did, we wouldn't be satisfied with the answer, like Ecclesiastes says. But here's a little hypothesis of my own. If you were forced to love someone, would you really love them? 
If you had never known any different, and you never questioned your love for that person, or even thought about questioning your love, would you really love them? If there was no other option, if it was just a fact of life, would it really be love? Why did God put the apple in the garden? Why would he give the potential for something so awful to happen? Why did he, he just not give humans the option to sin? I don't know, but I've always thought that the apple was there because that if it wasn't, and if there was no other option, then Adam and Eve wouldn't have really loved God. Love is a choice. Romans 4, 13 through 15 says, clearly, God's promise to the whole earth and Abraham and his descendants was not based on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary, and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment to those who try to obey it. There is only one way to avoid breaking the law, and that is to have no law to break. What's important in Adam and Eve's story to me was not the law they were breaking. It was their, their decision to not love and obey God. It was the idea that they could have faith and trust what God said about the apple, or they could disobey him and eat the apple. They could love God, or they could simply not. And if there is no law to break, then what would show their faith? Adam and Eve had free will to eat the apple. Free will is tricky, and that is what's always played on my doubt. It's so confusing to me, because how can God be all-knowing and still give me the option to choose him? Doesn't he already know what I'm going to do? When he creates someone, does he not see their whole life? Does he not see that he's creating this person and that in the end they will go to hell? How is that free will? I don't know. God himself is incredibly confusing to me. Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24 says, Am I a God who is only close at hand, says the Lord? No, I'm far away at the same time. Can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? God is everything and nothing, past and present and future, kind and understanding, but also vengeful and angry. I mean, after all, the whole book of Jeremiah is about God putting the Jewish people through horrendous things because they broke his laws. Then later, in Luke, Jesus comes to the people, and as I cited earlier from Romans, he says that laws aren't really what matter, and he loves us no matter what. It's all very, very confusing to me. I hope I'm not making you dizzy. A couple months ago, Amy asked us who Jesus was to us. This question comes from Luke 9.20 when Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say I am? This was a great question. It's so great that I haven't stopped thinking about it since. I started to wonder, if someone asked me why I believed in God, despite all the crazy stories in the Bible, what would I say? Would it be, I just always have? Would it be, that's what is it expected of me? Would it be, I've never thought of another option, or I never stopped and questioned it? Doubt is the apple in our garden. You can't love God without having a reason. You can't find a reason without searching for an answer, and you can't search for an answer if you don't have a doubt. Believing isn't seeing, but believing certainly isn't blind. It's calculated. It's a risk. And I wouldn't take a risk if I didn't have a reason. Why do I believe in God if I doubt him so much? I've seen his love. I have had so many friends who've showed me a love I can't explain, and it's always been there for a reason. Every bit of love I've ever felt was there for a reason. My existence is unexplainable, and it has been filled with an unexplainable love. That's, why I choose, that's what I choose to believe in. It's crazy, but so is everything else. Here's the last piece of scripture I will leave you with not to make you feel all better, but to keep you thinking about this important aspect of faith. Luke 22, 66 through 70 says, At daybreak, all the elders of the people assembled, including the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. Jesus was led before this high council, and they said, Tell us, are you the Messiah? But he replied, If I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place at power at God's right hand. They all shouted, So are you claiming to be the Son of God? And he replied, You say that I am. I don't know a lot of things, but I hate to let questions fall on flimsy shoulders. So I'll try to put all these doubts on something a little more solid. Maybe it's not the best answer, and I know it certainly won't satisfy me, but it's what I have to offer. Doubt doesn't make us bad people or bad believers. I think it makes us better. 
It make us, makes us question who God is to us and why we want a relationship with him at all. Doubt makes us question our faith, but in the end, it will be the thing that strengthens it. Don't blindly believe. Always question. Doubt, um, search for answers, and when you don't find them, question why they aren't there. Why do you believe in God? Why have you doubted him? What makes you choose to love him? So, thank you for bearing with me, and I hope you got as much out of me reading this as I got out of writing it. Thank you.